with all that data that's been accumulated to date, how in the world does that come into play for the AJCC? So let's talk about that. So the old system started in 1959. Remember, at that time, it was the Halsteadian concept, right? Tumor goes to lymph nodes, goes from the lymph nodes somewhere else. We know that's not true. We know in an era of microscopic disease in blood and bone marrow, for instance, there are other ways that tumor cells can spread beyond just that same old, you know, TNM kind of idea. So with the first through seventh editions, it relied on the anatomic, you know, designation. And so now with this eighth stage, you're going to see the inclusion of biologic markers to better identify the patients that are really at risk. So the, the difference with the eighth edition is that current practice now recognizes that there's been changes in treatment. Think about it. In the first through seventh, much of the early editions were based on the patient having surgery and radiation therapy. That was their, their treatment. Now you've got adjuvant therapies, targeted therapies. We have new information on biologic, prognostic, and predictive markers. Also, we know that breast conservation has become a much more common treatment modality than mastectomy from the previous era. And we have reduced axillary staging. Remember, we talked already about sentinel node, targeted axillary dissection. We're moving away further from taking out all the lymph nodes. So all these had to be figured into the new system. <clears throat> and the new eighth edition is a big change because it incorporates biomarkers and multi-gene assays. And we'll see in a minute how it really better defines the patient's uh, prognostic stage. So this all started when um, some of my MD Anderson colleagues, uh, Drs. Mittendorf, Hunt, Min Yi, um, looked at a very large database, over 3,700 patients who had no known distant metastasis. The patients had known biomarkers and a minimum two years of follow-up. So what they did is they calculated the disease-specific survival from the time of diagnosis to the time of their death due to breast cancer. And from that, they were able to utilize the pathologic stage to derive a prognostic model for disease-specific survival. And then from that, they did univariate and multivariate models to identify the factors that would be associated with disease-specific survival. So you could take ER, PR, grade, lymphovascular invasion. And the limitations of their first go-around with this is that it didn't include um, the, the, it was predated the use of trastuzumab for HER2 positive patients. So they updated the model by incorporating a cohort of HER2 positive patients. They repeated the multivariate analysis, um, looking for factors associated with disease-specific survival. So now you've got a scoring system where you can take patients within each anatomic stage group and further define their likelihood of relapsing or dying from breast cancer. And so with each hazard ratio that you identify for each factor, you just assign a point scale. So if you had a low hazard ratio of 1 to 1.3, you get one point. But look, if you have a high hazard ratio of more than 10, you get four points. And so what that looks like is something like this, where you see the five-year uh, disease-specific survival here, and then you've got your assigned points. So if you were a pathologic stage 3C and your hazard ratio is above 10, you're going to get four points. If you're ER negative, you're going to get one point. Okay, so you get actually assigned scores based upon your biological markers. And we would all agree this is very important in how we not only stage patients, but how we treat them. So this is the, the change to the new edition. Um, the second piece that was used to, to formulate the eighth uh, edition is from David Winchester's group, who used the NCDB to look at over 238,000 patients in the NCDB <clears throat> with a median follow-up of 38 months, and they did a similar kind of thing where they did survival calculations based on the seventh edition stage group, grade, HER2, and ER and PR. And interestingly, their findings were very similar to the MD Anderson model that we just talked about. And so the prognostic subgroups are now assigned to stage based on the calculated mean survival of each group. So now, as you'll see in a second, a, a, a stage 3A, not all 3As are the same. You have differences based upon biological markers. And so this is what it kind of looks like when you look at the um, risk profile here by your points assigned and your stage. So look at the difference in stage 3As. Not all 3As are the same. A 3A with a zero risk profile has an excellent five-year overall survival. And look when they have a, a profile of three. Much different. So now you have better discrimination between each of the stage groups. Not everyone's lumped together. And biologic markers and this risk profile have allowed that to happen. 
What's really interesting is when you apply the new staging criteria to breast cancer, you get shifting. So more than 40% of patients with stage 1 to 3 breast cancer were restaged. Half went higher, half went lower based on this new staging criteria. So again, you're going to move some patients around and you're going to see in a second, this is going to be, it's going to take some time to incorporate because this is what it looks like now. This is the eighth edition. <clears throat> we talked about 3A patients, but look how different 3A can be. Here's a 3A, a T2, N0, grade 3, HER2 negative, PR negative. So that's now a 3A, but also a T3, N0, grade 2, um, ER positive can be 3A. So you're basing this on the estimated survival calculation. So now you have a wide discrepancy. So this is going to take a little while to incorporate, but clearly you're getting better discrimination between the patient groups where not everybody's lumped in together. And so the Taylor X data was used as an additional factor to downstage patients. So if you have the Oncotype score, and again, the Oncotype is the only one that's included for, as level one evidence for downstaging a patient and that prognostic score to a group 1A. There are, other, there are other assays, and we'll talk about that in a second, but they felt, the panel felt that only the Oncotype had the level of evidence to bring the prognostic score back to a 1A. So as you'll see in a second, how could that work in practice? How would we actually use that? And I think this slide best illustrates that, and it's pretty amazing if you think about it. This patient could be a T2, grade 2, PR negative. Now you've got a 2B. If they have an Oncotype score that's less than 11, that patient is now a stage 1A prognostic group. <clears throat> Even a 3A, a T2, grade 3, PR negative, could now be downstaged to a 1A with a score of less than 11. And the reason for that is that, as we saw, those patients have a less than 1% recurrence risk. So they can all safely be brought back to a prognostic stage 1A and think about it, these patients most likely would have gotten chemotherapy in the past, right? And now they would safely be able to omit that. So a big change from the previous editions. Now, let's just look at a case study about how you would use that. This is actually one of my patients that I ordered the test on. The patient was 59 years old, had a 3.5 centimeter tumor, postmenopausal, um, ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative. Interestingly, with these parameters, based on the new system, in a grade of 3 and lymph node negative, that person would have been put into the prognostic group 2A, okay, based on the new 8th eighth, eighth edition staging. Because of ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative, even with the grade 3, they'd fall into a 2A. But this patient was reluctant about whether or not they wanted to do chemotherapy, I talked to the medical oncologist, and he said, you know what, let's go ahead and order an oncotype, and let's see. We order an oncotype, she comes back with a 3. That patient is now brought down to a prognostic stage 1A. So this patient did not receive chemotherapy, received only endocrine therapy, and I forgot to tell you that this case was from 2012, and that patient has never recurred. So these cases, I think, are illustrative of the new era of if we find patients with these low scores, they can change their outcome and their, their treatment course pretty dramatically. And again, you can see by the graphical representation here, this is the estimated benefit of chemotherapy in this patient, which is essentially zero. So it was not used. And what about the other genomic assays? I think we should touch on that. So um, there are multiple assays that are available. We all know and, and potentially um, have heard about some of these. However, again, I'm, I'm pointing out that in the AJCC 8th edition, the uh, oncotype is the only one that can be used to bring a patient down to prognostic stage 1 because based upon the level of evidence of 1, as we saw from that Taylor X data in arm A. You have other multi-gene assays. Those are considered level 2 for their data as far as the AJCC and are not utilized to bring patients down to that um, prognostic stage 1A. So to conclude, the 8th edition is very different from what we've dealt with before, and I think it's going to take all of us some time to kind of get that incorporated into practice. It's not something that's going to be picked up immediately. But there are some really great points about it. It, it makes much finer discrimination between the patients per stage group. Also, it, if you think about it, all this 
data will allow us to develop and, and improve the optimal staging of patients in the future because we're collecting the data prospectively now. And apparently the, the plan of the group is to introduce rolling updates to the staging system so you don't have to wait every six to eight years to get the, the, the new data. So you actually can get improvements uh, continuously. But it is more complex. And finally, <clears throat> we can now successfully downstage patients who have a score of less than 11, knowing they have a less than 1% distant recurrence rate, and do it safely. We can safely omit chemotherapy, and by do that, we're actually reducing the morbidity to these patients by, giving, by, by avoiding giving them a treatment that has no benefit. And by doing that, we're actually improving their outcome and their quality of life, which is, I think, what we've all would strive to do, right? So I think um, with that, I would say thank you for coming, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.